All right. Hello, everyone. So the lesson of this is make sure and turn your slides in more than an hour before your, uh, before your talk starts. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Alan Gates. I um, work at Hortonworks. And today, we want to talk about uh, the work that's been going on in the Hive community recently to add uh, full transactions acid to Hive. So um, just a quick overview in case you're not you don't live and breathe databases every day. ACID stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Basically, all the things you ex you've come to expect of a database, but that weren't in um, you know weren't in Hive traditionally or weren't in Hadoop applications traditionally. Of course, we can't pass up the opportunity to you know have a little fun with Hive doing ACID. So we always put that in the title and make various references to it here and there. But anyway, so what's uh, what does this mean to add transactions and update and delete to Hive? What, what, you know, what's important about that? But first, let's do a little bit of history of why did we have to add this? Why wasn't it there from the beginning? So traditionally, Hive only had um, insert, and you really did that mostly by adding new partitions. Uh, Hive grew up in a world where you brought data in on a regular basis, often daily, maybe hourly. You uh, generally added a new partition, and then you didn't touch that data. That worked well with the Hadoop paradigm where data is, you know, where the Hadoop file system is write once, read many. Um, now, there are, were ways to, cha to change that. You could do an insert overwrite of a partition or a table where you would you know, wipe out what was in there and put in completely new stuff. You could even add files to existing partitions, but there weren't um, good uh, acidity guarantees around that. And um, there's also no ability to go back and compact those files together. So if you just do that on a regular basis, you grow more and more files, and that obviously causes you some problems. Um, so, and there wasn't a lot, there weren't guarantees too around um, con uh, concurrency. If you're doing, if you're adding in new files, especially insert overwrite, um, you know, what if somebody's reading the, f the partition at the same time you execute insert overwrite, you remove the partition, add something new, what happens to that reader? Um, there were there is a, a zookeeper lock manager available. Some people use it, not a lot, but basically there were there were issues there. There were no way to update or delete rows. That just wasn't available. You, if you wanted to do that, you had to um, rewrite the entire partition, or in a non-partition table, you had to rewrite the whole table. Um, and we're just lacking some stuff like insert into values clauses that uh, a lot of tools it turns out use those. Right. So you you want to add those things. So why why do we need it? We worked all this time without it. We went for you know years with without acid, and and often it was sold as a trade-off for performance. You know, we got rid of transactions; it speeds things up. To some degree, that's you know there is a trade-off performance or performance trade-off there. But um, the thing is that your data isn't static. There's a whole lot you can do with the loaded into a partition every hour and read it, but there are some things you can't do there. Um, and what we saw happening was more and more users were trying to add this in on the side. They were coming up with creative ways to do updates or deletes to change things because they needed them, right? And so as we saw more and more users trying to do this, the first user we saw do it, we're like, okay, they're just misusing the system. But then you see another user do it and another, and you realize, okay, people really want these things. They do want to be able to update and delete data, even in a data warehousing type situation. So we realized we, this is something we needed to be looking at. So what, what use cases are we going after here? What are we trying to add? As soon as you say transactions, a lot of people's minds goes to OLTP, the, you know, the quick, high speed, lots of transactions per second, um, very interactive, build a shopping cart, that kind of stuff. That's not what we're after here. Um, that's not Hive's strength. That's um, not, not what we tried to build. But what we did see people trying to do with this is things like um, changes to dimension tables. If um, in a star schema, you lay out all your data, you know, the, the events of the day come in the fact table, but you have these dimension tables that record all the, you know, things like customers and stores and uh, product, whatever all is in your, your data set. Well, those things do change. I mean, if you're a retailer, um, and you have, you know, you open new stores. You want to be able to add records into your, your stores table. Customers come and go. 
Customers may update their information. You may have a customer and he moves and you want to change his address, right? Now there are um, slowly changing dimension strategies around which you don't ever actually update the record, you just insert it, but it's also convenient. Not everybody wants to follow those. It's convenient to be able to update things. Occasionally you even need to delete things, right? For legal compliance, a customer, when they terminate their relationship with you, with you, you may need to get them out of the system. You may actually be required to remove their data. Um, so you'd like to be able to delete records. We also saw people doing restatement uh, in their fax tables. Sometimes you, you bring a bunch of data in, you realize something wasn't quite right, you need to go back and fix it, maybe you know the clock on one of your servers was in the wrong time zone or something. Or even just, we actually saw a lot of users um, say you sell a product and uh, next week you have a, a sale on that and you have some kind of guarantee to your, uh, to your customer that if the product they buy goes on sale within a month of them buying it, you'll give them the sale price instead of the original price. Well, they needed to be able to go back and restate that because now the sale price is different and they would actually record that by going back in time and changing the fact, as it were. Um, so you want to be able to do those kinds of things. The other thing we see, and I'll talk more about this a little further on, is people want to be able to ingest data very quickly into these systems. They want to be able to stream their data in from things like Flume or Storm or Kafka or whatever you're using for your uh, storming, or sorry, for your streaming uh, data. You want to be able to get that quickly into the system and not, not have a long time to make that available to your users. And so that's, those are the use cases we went after when we set out on this. Um, so what did we actually add? Uh, we added in Hive 14, which was released uh, February, I think, a while ago anyway. Um, no, sorry, Hive 14 was released in December, um, last December. We added new statements into the Hive's SQL. So you can now do insert into T values and give a list of values. That actually doesn't have anything specific to do with ACID, but we added it at the same time because we found it to be useful. Um, we added the ability to do updates and deletes in you know, standard SQL syntax. These support um, both partitioned and non-partitioned tables. Your where clause in the update or delete can in include your partition key, but it doesn't have to. Obviously, if, if it doesn't include your partition key and you're a partition table, it means it'll be applied to all the partitions in the table, but if that's what you want, it'll work. So what are the restrictions on this? We didn't make every table do this automatically. Um, so there's some restrictions. One is we needed support in the, in the actual storage. There's things that have to happen in the storage layer to make this possible, and I'll cover more why that is in a bit. But, um, so you have to have a, a storage format that implements these new input and output formats we've created called ACID input format and ACID output format. Um, currently ORC, the ORC storage format, uh, does that. There's also uh, work going on right now to make it so that Parquet can do that, and there's a Jira there, you can follow that if you're interested. Um, we require the table to be bucketed, and um, it'll become obvious as I talk later on about why that is, but it basically it just makes it much easier to do this in a performant way. And um, for now, we say that the table, you have to actually explicitly mark the table transactional. This is just to avoid um, turning this feature on on people that aren't ready for it, basically, right? We, wouldn't, we don't like turning things on by default. We like to put them in and leave them off by default and let people experiment with them, decide whether they want to use it and go with it. So at some point in the future that, you know, the need to mark a table transactional, that'll go away. It'll just kind of be quietly sunsetted. But we did it for now just to, you know, ease people's transition into this. So how does this work? Um, the HDFS is a write once file system, right? You can't go back and change records. If somebody creates a partition and then later they decide they want to update records inside that partition, there's no way in HDFS to go in and rewrite those bits. It doesn't allow that. It turns out that um, a, a lot of the big data warehousing systems, even the ones that do run on uh, fully POSIX compliant file systems where you could go change individual records, choose not to because the, the cost of, you know, the random write and read cost involved with that is just excessive. You, you can't do that well on large sets of data. And so the, the standard 
approach here that's been, you know, this has been done by Vertica, by um, SQL Server PDW, a number of other technologies, is you don't store the changes in the main file, you actually store them in a side file called a delta file. And then at read time, you stitch together those, uh, the, your original source of truth and the new data, or sorry, the new record, to, to figure out which version of truth you should see. And part of that is controlled by the transaction information that the reader is given. So the Metastore now gives out jobs transaction IDs, and a reader knows, okay, this is the tr set of transactions that are valid for me to see. Because there may be writers writing data at the same time you're reading, there may be data in there that your reader encounters that he has to say, oh, that's not valid uh, for me. That's not a record I should see. And so the reader has to be aware of that information and, and uh, pull that out. And this provides snapshot uh, consistency for the readers. So that means you start your query, you get some set of transaction information, you're guaranteed for the uh, duration of that query that you will see that same set of data. If you went back and reread the files, even if people have deleted records or updated records, you would still see the same information. It would not have changed from your viewpoint. So a question everybody asks, um, why didn't you just use HBase? This feels like you're reinventing a wheel here. And um, it's, a, it's a valid question. It's a question we asked ourselves for a long time before we, um, before we built this is, you know, should we just put it in HBase? And there are some pluses here, right? It, it already handles compactions for us, and I'll talk about what we needed to do to deal with compactions in a bit. Um, and its LSM data model is very similar to what we're building here. And so why couldn't we just use it? There, there were some drawbacks, however. It didn't, at the time that we started, there were no cross-row transactions in HBase. Rights to an individual uh, row were guaranteed, be, guaranteed to be atomic but writes across rows were not. Um, there is work going on now in HBase to address that, though it's not complete yet. Uh, but we started this a year and a half ago. There, we weren't even aware of that work at the time, and we determined it would be almost as much work to write the transactional layer as it would be to, um, pardon me, to do the, the other stuff this way. Um, HFile, which HBase stores its data in, is column family based rather than columnar based, and for Data warehousing queries, you really want columnar data formats. It works very well. And then finally, and this is really, at least to me, the key point, HBase's sweet spot, and it's very, very good at it, is looking up single records or a range of records based on keys, right? Find me the records with this key. Find me all the records where the key is between 0 and 100. It's excellent at that. That's not the kind of queries Hive tends to answer. Hive tends to do large aggregate queries, um, where you're gonna scan, once you determine you're gonna scan a partition, you're probably gonna scan the whole partition. You're not looking for just a set of keys in there. And so it, there's just a little bit of an impedance mis mismatch in there in trying to figure out, okay, could, would HBase provide us the right kind of scan performance that we want to do this? What? Why not both? Well, because it, um, come to my talk, so the question is why not use both, and the answer is come to my talk at 5.30 and I'll tell you how we are trying to use both. <laughs> um, so, okay, so how does this work on the read side? Uh, you see here on the, at the top uh, left-hand corner you've got a, your base file. This is the data as originally written, and it's got just the data name and you know, what they bought. Apparently this was a fish, a pet store or something. They bought different fish. Um, then you see below that a couple of updates that came in, and you'll notice that those delta files contain some information that the base file uh, doesn't have there, which is what operation was done on them. Was it an insert, an update, or a delete? What transaction ID it was done as a part of, and what the row ID is. And that row ID is just used to do the matchup between the base and the delta file, so you understand what record in the base this delta is applying to. And then the, the reader now stitches that together to produce one logical um, answer for what that user should see. Um, so how did, how did we do this in HDFS? We didn't change the layout except that now underneath the partition files there are both, uh, there are base directories and delta directories so that we can keep track of you know, the different files. So if you start using this, you'll see your layout change a little bit on HDFS. Um, 
but the rest of the tools will still pretty much understand it because it's, you know, it's still down to the partition level. It looks exactly the same. Um, as I mentioned before, we created new input and output formats because we needed, um, we needed this ability to track the transaction ID and the ability to um, keep the track of the row ID. That actually has to be pushed down into the storage format, so we needed uh, input and output formats that could keep track of that. Um, we also added a, the, these formats also support the compactor, which I'll talk about later, but that's basically the thing that goes and rewrites these delta files into the base eventually. Um, as I said, ORC implements this new API um, and adds the, this new information into, the, uh, into each row. So you still have to produce splits for MapReduce or Tez or Spark or whatever you're using as your reader here. So um, the, the storage format needs to handle that. You, it gets a range of keys in the base file and then it, it uses the indexes inside the storage format to make sure it gets those same ranges of keys in the delta files. Um, we sort the base and the delta by this uh, transaction ID, row ID, um, pair so that we know that at read time we can do that merge efficiently, right? So that you're merging and you're not having to do lookups in one file or the other. It's just a, a read time merge. All right, so in addition to changes to the storage format, we had to actually add a transaction manager because um, Hive didn't have one in the past. At first, this looks like a lot of work because transaction managers have to be pretty bulletproof. You don't want... Um, you know, you don't want mistakes, you don't want data you said it was committed, not being committed. You want your locks to work well and stuff. Um, so there were a couple of lock managers in existence in Hive. There's an in-memory one, which um, as far as I could tell was just for testing. I mean, obviously if it's only in memory, it's not durable in the face of failure. And then there was a Zookeeper one, which um, worked fine, but it does require additional components. I mean, do you, uh, not everybody sets up a Zookeeper cluster next to their Hive cluster. And it didn't quite have the model we needed for transactions because you need your locks to be very uh, tightly coupled with your transaction manager, right? When you do a commit or a rollback on your transaction, that should atomically release the locks. Um, and so we needed to do some work to integrate that. What, the thing that made this much, much easier is we realized we have a something that's already uh, transactional at the core of our metadata system, which is a relational database. Right? We use MySQL or Postgres or whatever it is you want to use in your setup um, at the core of Hive's metadata system to actually store the metadata. And we could rely on its transactional semantics to give us transactions so, and locks. So uh, the Metastore now provides unique ascending IDs for these transactions and locks. It is what's often called in a transaction system the time, um, the time server, though that's a little bit... Um, misleading because it's not actually time. There, it's not track, it's not a universal clock. It's just giving IDs that it promises are ascending. And so now when a reader or writer wants to start a transaction, they go to the Metastore and say, I want to open the transaction and here's the files I need to lock. And um, that, it's, it's all brokered through there. Um, so what is our transaction model? Uh, as a, for in the initial release in high 14, everything's auto commit, so there's not yet a begin or start um, and then commit rollback. Those don't, those aren't in the language yet. Um, we, I'll talk more about that later. We are working on adding that. Um, the isolation is snapshot, so that means that you will see a consistent set of data for your read or write for the extension for the duration of your query, um, and you can. Uh, you can see what transactions are current in the system. We added uh, a show transactions command. So what kind of locking did we add here? Um, traditionally, databases often have a shared and exclusive lock. We actually took a slightly different path. We added a shared lock, which is pretty standard. Semi-shared, which means a semi-shared lock can coexist with a shared lock, but it cannot coexist with another sh semi-shared lock. Um, and exclusive, which is you know, what you think it means, only I get the lock. So selects and inserts take shared locks. That means we can have as many readers or people writing new records as we want all at the same time. Now it's not immediately intuitive that insert should take a shared lock. That might not be what you would expect, 
but because Hive doesn't support unique constraints, it's never wrong for two people to write uh, at the same time because there's no notion of same record. It, my record couldn't uh, conflict with yours because they can't be the same. We don't have uh, primary keys. Um, updates and deletes take out semi-shared locks. So this means that I can only have one, um, one entity updating or deleting a given partition at a given time. So this is also how we handle conflict resolution. We don't allow multiple writers to update at the same time and then at the end do some kind of first committer wins or anything like that. We just block it out so that if I'm updating a partition and you come along, you have to wait till I'm done. Now, this is one of those places where I said we didn't design this for OLTP. That's not a choice you would ever make in an OLTP system, right? That would be a completely horrible choice for OLTP because you tend to have thousands of people, you know, thousands of transactions going on. You can't lock down partitions in your table. But again, that's not what we're going for, right? We're assuming this is something where you're going to come in, maybe every hour you're going to bring in a batch of changes and update those. So the conflicts, you know, the number of conflicts are going to be pretty low. And then finally, there's exclusive locks, which, you know, you're going to drop the table. You'd like, you know, nobody should be in the table when you drop it. That's very basic kind of stuff. Um, okay, so each transaction, or in the streaming ingest, each batch of transactions creates a new set of delta files. It, it doesn't take long to realize this isn't, you know, left to itself, that's going to run away and kill things. Um, as any of you who run Hadoop clusters know, too many name too many files in your name node gets really cranky at you really fast. Even if you didn't have that problem, um, the fan in on the merge for the reader would just get out of control on you, right? So if, you've got, if you had hundreds of Delta files and your reader had to stitch all those together, you're gonna spend all your time just trying to decide which record should I read next from which file. So you, you need a way to occasionally compact these. We came up with a, a two-tiered system and we have what we call a minor compaction where you take all the existing delta files and you compact them into one delta file. You don't change the base, you still have a base and delta, but now you're down to one delta file. And then a major compaction, which is where you actually go rewrite the base. You take the base, you merge it with the delta or deltas, and you create a whole new base file. Um, so just to kind of uh, demonstrate that, this is what this would look like. The minor compactions, um, you, have, you start out with you know, a bunch of delta files and a base. When you're done, you have this base and, and one delta. A couple things to notice here. Um, one is, notice how the transaction IDs are actually encoded in the file names, so that you can see all those base files are getting, or sorry, all those delta files are getting collapsed into that bottom delta file. Um, that actually helps the reader, because the reader knows what transactions are valid for it. It, it can use this to actually do uh, scan pruning as it's going along, because it can realize, oh, I can't, see anything in that file because I don't have any transactions. You know, all my transaction history is previous to that or something, so I don't even need to read that file. Um, right now, um, minor compactions are run whenever there are 10 or more deltas, so I guess one thing I didn't say is the compaction stuff is completely automated inside the system. You as a user don't need to run it. Uh, the system decides when to do that. Um, that 10, you know, doing it when there are 10 or more deltas was chosen by the extremely scientific method of me sitting at my desk and going, 10's a nice number. So, we don't have any empirical evidence that it's the right number, right? So we made it configurable. As time goes on, we get more kind of data on is 10 good, would five be better, would 20 be better, what's the right number there? We may adjust that default, but we wanna leave it configurable because I strongly suspect that what's optimal in your situation might not be optimal in somebody else's situation, right? Um, all right, and then this is a demo of what, or I mean a, a little idea of what a, a major compaction does. So here you start out with a base, a bunch of delta files. When you're done, you just have a base file. Again, notice that even the base file says, hey, I have data up to this transaction ID. So that last number, 0028500 there is our, you know, that's their transaction IDs up to that identifier in there. Um, these are run when the deltas exceed 10% of the size of the base file. Again, chosen by the same extremely scientific method, so again, uh, configurable. So um, the Metastore server actually uh, schedules and executes these compactions. There's no need for you to do it. Now, people get confused here because they think, oh my gosh, you're running this inside the Metastore, you're gonna kill my metadata access. 
The Metastore doesn't itself compact the data. All it does is launch jobs into the cluster to do that compaction for you. So what it watches, basically it watches the transaction and lock tables. It realizes when, um, when jobs have updated things and, and it goes and checks and says, should I start one of these compactions? If it decides it does, it launches a job. And it also, um, it's integrated with the Kerberos security so that it can say, oh, this data is owned by Alan, and so I should run my compaction as Alan to make this happen so that he still owns the data. It doesn't end up you know, mucking with the ownership of the data, and that kind of stuff. Um, an important point here and something that we worked really hard at is there's no GC type pauses here. We don't lock down the system, anything like that. You can read and, and write both during compactions. That, that does not pause the use of the table in either direction. So yep, while the compactor is running along writing new files, you can still be reading the old ones. You can still be writing new delta files that won't be a part of that compaction that will be applied to whatever the results of that compaction are. Um, and the compaction actually has, the compactor has the logic to go, okay, I've compacted these five delta files into this new base, but I know that there's readers out reading those delta files, so I won't actually remove them until those readers have told me they're done. So it actually watches the lock table and waits till all the readers that held locks on those files release before it, it removes those files. So you, don't, you also don't have to worry about a compaction happens in the data, you know, the older version of the data you were using gets removed, that, that's maintained for you. Um, okay, so let me talk a little bit more about the streaming ingest use case. Um, so what I've talked about before was mostly SQL based, you know, using update, using delete. Another case that we see people using more and more is they're trying to stream data into their, their system. So you've got you know, data coming in from your transactional systems, your front end serving systems, whatever they are, that comes in at a constant rate, right? Traditionally, Hive, as I said, you usually added partitions every hour or something. Hive couldn't handle data all the time. Um, the, so that's a big impedance mismatch, right? You're, you've got data coming in constantly, but your Hive users can't see it until the next partition's added, so that's often an hour. Um, that's that doesn't make it super usable for up-to-date kind of things. What you want to be able to do is see that data very quickly. So we added a new interface to, um, to Hive. It's just a Java interface that allows you to stream those records in, commit them very frequently, say every few seconds, maybe every minute, whatever works in what you're trying to do. And then your users can see that data immediately so that now the, um, the wait time, the lag time, between when whatever Kafka or Flume, whatever you're using, brings that data in to when it's available to your users goes down from an hour to maybe a minute or two. Um, we have uh, integrated this already with Flume and with Storm. Uh, you know, we're certainly interested in other people integrating with it. It's just a Java interface that any project can implement. Um, so kind of how did this proceed so far? Um, in Hive 13, 0.13, we had the, the kind of laid the groundwork for this, but it, there wasn't, it wasn't super available to people yet, except the streaming ingest was available via Flume. Um, honestly, if you're on Hive 13, don't try that in production. It's, there were just a lot of bugs there. It wasn't ready. Um, in, with Hive 14, we added um, the insert with values and then update and delete. In Hive 1.2, uh, we added a little bit more support for inserts, so now you can specify what columns you want to insert. And then um, things that we might do in the future, actually I think I have another, yeah, let me talk a little bit about what's kind of what's going on now and where we want to go with this. So what are people working on now? We'd like to add multi-statement transactions so that you can do a begin, a commit, a rollback. Um, we, we didn't add that in the first pass because it was more testing and we didn't have a deadlock um, detector, so we didn't, in, you know, if, when you're doing things auto commit, you don't actually have to detect deadlocks because you can know a priori everything a query is going to need. As soon as you allow a begin statement, you, you have to lock as you go along, so now you have to te detect if I locked A and asked for B and you locked B and asked for A and we've got to be able to find that and break it. So, so there's some things like that that we have to add. Um, that work is ongoing and you can track that at the Hive Jira there. Um, there's work going on 
to add support for update and delete and streaming ingest. So I guess one thing I didn't do a good job of saying is the streaming ingest at this point is insert only. It's just blowing new records in. There's no support for actually restating for updates and deletes. Uh, there's work going on right now to change that. You can see the patch, or see the Jira rather right there. Uh, if you want to read a bunch of code and help me review the patch, it's, the patch is up there, uh, you know, feedback is very welcome. And then there's work going on to make it so that this works with Parquet as well as Oracle. Um, I believe that also has a patch up that people can review if you're interested. Okay, so where do we want to go next? What, um, what kind of things do we want to add? Um, it, as soon as people started using this, one thing they said to us is, this is nice, but what I really wanted was merge, right? And, and that's good. I mean, you know, at first you can kind of go, oh, man, I, but you realize you build something, people use it, then they tell you what you want next, right? This is how iterative software development works, so it's a good thing. But, so what is merge, in case you're not, used, you're not familiar with it, is, this was added to SQL in 2003. It, it basically allows upserts. It's the ability to bring in a, a whole batch of things and in one pass say, hey, if these records are already in my table, just update them. If they're not already there, um, insert them. There's other things you can do with merge, that's not it. But that's really what our users, at least, are telling us they want. And so a, use case, a typical use case here would be every half hour I use scoop or whatever to load data out of my transactional system. I drop it in a temp table. Now I want to blend that with my, my fact table. Um, so that's, what, that's the use case we want to be able to, we want to enable. Um, we're just starting, we've kind of gone through the design on how we think this will work. Uh, we hope to start development on this very soon. Um, what else is next? We need to improve the performance of this. There's some performance impact of using these things. It basically it doesn't play well with the way Tez does splits, so your Tez queries slow down um, if you've got a lot of Delta files. Uh, predicate pushdown, which is something that Ork can do, um, I believe Parquet can do as well, where you uh, basically you take parts of your where clause and you actually push them clear into the storage layer so that you're only reading um, the relevant data. That doesn't um, that doesn't work against the delta files, and it's a little bit complicated to do that because you can't start, you have to be careful about how you apply those because if you start, say, weeding out deletes out of your deltas, if bad things will happen, people will get wrong data, so we need to work on that. And then we need to make this more usable. I, I said we made it so you had to mark the table transactional. That was just kind of training wheels. But we need to remove this requirement to bucket. Now you have to bucket some to, I mean you have to do some bucketing to eliminate the search space for the reader when it's trying to do those merges, right? It's got a base file, it's got a delta. The buckets really help it trim down, okay, I know I'm only looking in these areas for this record. But we need to at least make that transparent to users, right? We can do that underneath. We don't have to force that on you to say, okay, you figure out how to bucket the table for us. Um, we can take that on ourselves and figure out how to do the bucketing. Those are the kind of, areas we want to work on next. Um, all right, so just in conclusion, here as you can see, oh, well, that didn't split well across the 9 to 16, but anyway, the high, high 5317 was the original JIRA that talked about this. I believe that's closed now, but I think new things might still be linked to it, I'm not sure. Um, we added acid semantics to Hive. We added update, insert, update, and delete SQL standard commands. And that's it. Uh, questions? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. So the question is how it, um, you can create basically an external table or you can drop in a file. It, so if it's a file format that supports this, or or can manage the fact that you start with a file that's not transactional and it can apply deltas to it, and then when it does the first uh, compaction, it will actually do what it needs to do to make that work. We had to make that, even not regarding external tables, we had to make that uh, feasible just for transition, right? People wanted, if we want people to transition, we didn't want them to have to copy all their data. Okay, so the question is, is the compaction configuration global or table level? It is global at this point. So the one thing that I didn't mention in here is you as a user can manually 
uh, request a compaction if you want. You just say alter table compact and then you say either minor or major. But we didn't, I think it might be a little unwieldy. I mean, I guess you could start adding annotations to the table to say do it more aggressively on this table than some others. That's an interesting thought. We hadn't actually contemplated that. Um, here and then I'll go over there. Yes. Um, so the question is what databases do we use? Well, the thing is Hive already stores its Metastore even before any of this, it stored it in a database. It can actually, currently Hive supports Oracle, Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server, and Derby in test mode. Yeah, you can use it. This works over any of those. We didn't um, make any uh, changes there that anything database specific. How much is exposed through HCAT? So the streaming stuff, I mean, you'd be able to read it via HCAT. What we haven't done yet is enable you to um, read and write at the transactional level in HCAT. And the reason we haven't done that is we have to have the multi um, statement transaction because in HCAT we don't know a priori what data you're gonna touch. So we have to be able to handle the fact that you're gonna be adding locks as you go. So once we get that in, then we'll add in integration with H catalog. So at what level is the read consistency there? Um, so ORC, or whatever your storage format is, has a, along with the Metastore has all the information um, that you need to provide the snapshot isolation. So we haven't done the, again, we haven't done the integration with H catalog, which is how we would do it for PIG, or even directly with PIG, but the pieces are there that we could. Um, we haven't done it yet because we don't have the lock management system that we need yet, right? Yes, so d data locality is an issue. We need, um, we need support from HDFS to be able to co-locate those Delta files. That's a conversation we're having with the HDFS team right now. Um, let me, I, I will get to the questions, but let me go here, I think you were next. I'm sorry, what? Yes. So inserts do allow shared, that, that's fine, because again, they can't conflict, right? And you can have one, uh, one writer either updating or deleting at the same time. That all works just fine, I and mean, we've tested all that, because um, we just make sure only one person's making changes to the data at a time, in that sense. Right, does it support replication? It does not yet support the replication available through like Falcon and stuff. That's on the to-do list, but we haven't gotten that integration done yet. Um, I think there was a question over here and then I'll come this way. Right, what's the sweet spot on buckets? Um, that's a hard question, right, because it, um, I don't, I, like there isn't just some theoretical sweet spot. And that's why when I said we want to get to the point where we manage the bucketing instead of forcing the user to do it, I think that's the right answer because then the system can optimize for itself rather than trying to force you to do it. Because right now it's really based on size. You, you want to kind of minimize, um, you want to make sure every bucket is of sufficient size without being too small. I, I can't just give like an off the top of my head, it should be eight or 16 or whatever, I don't know, right? Okay, come on over here, yes. I, I'm sorry, can you say it again? I couldn't hear. Okay. Well, so define duplicate. When you update, there is, um, I mean, there's another copy of the record, but it's got the transaction IDs in it, so the reader knows which version of the record to read, right? That's what the transaction information gives it. So say you inserted a record, and it was transaction ID one, and then I come and update that record in transaction ID two. When a reader comes along, he's gonna say, which valid, you know, none of those transactions might be valid for him, in which case he won't see any version of it. 
if transaction one is valid for him but not two, he'll see version one. If two is valid, then he'll see version two, right? So it's, it's really MVCC, it's multi-version uh, storage of the records. Wait, sorry, what? I, I, sorry, I can't hear two things at once. What? It doesn't allow to pick a record what? There, there are no duplicate rows in Hive. There, there is no definition of duplicate. Even if rows have exactly the same data in them, they are not duplicates because duplicate implies that a uniqueness constraint which we don't support. So if we supported that, then we would have, then it would be more work to actually do the inserts and, and the updates because you'd have to make sure you don't update to a new version of it, right? So, but since we don't do that, we don't have that problem. You know, Right, so the question is, does Impala support this? Um, strangely enough, Cloudera doesn't share their roadmap plans with me. <laughs> but um, the, I know that the Parquet guys are working on it, and I know that earlier this spring I talked with one of their um, developers about what it would take to make Par uh, Impala support this. But I don't know if they were interested in actually doing the updates or if they just wanted to be able to read transactional tables, because that's actually what he asked me about, is what would they need to do to make sure they got the right version of the data. So I, but I, beyond that, I do, all I can tell you is talk to them. I don't know what their Impala plans are. Yes. So how do we plan to implement the merge? So in merge with, sorry, how do we plan to implement merge without a primary key? Um, you, you are given a, um, when you merge, you can specify a key to merge onto. We're also trying to think about, um, can we start to make use of the fact that people are bucketing it and use that as the key? There's, how to make that most usable to people is something we're still working through. But um, you, merge does give you the ability to merge on things other than the primary key. Okay. Right. So is Golden Gate and those kinds of tools integrated? We have had discussions with the Golden Gate guys. I am not actually sure where they're at on their integration. And I'm being told to shut up um, and get off the stage. So if you guys have other questions, I'm not going anywhere. Feel free to come up. Sorry I didn't get to all the questions, um, but thank you.